Thanks, Sophie. Hello, good evening. You're watching Look North, our top story tonight. Can you save Lucas, the seriously ill 14-year-old who desperately needs a new kidney? We're not naive enough to think there's a miracle cure at the minute. We're not naive enough to think they'll ever have a miracle cure, but this will just give him a normal, decent shot at a life. And that's all we can ask for as parents. We'll let you know how you can help. Also tonight, the senior police officer in charge of West Yorkshire's COVID response admits mo gross misconduct over an extramarital affair during lockdown. <laughs> Hitting the high notes on the high street, shoppers get a pop-up opera performance in Leeds. And you've been sending them in all day. We've got the best of your pictures of last night's supermoon. Well, it's been another spectacular day, hasn't it? Look at the sky in Farsley earlier on this afternoon. But will the sunshine tomorrow? Join me for that detailed forecast. Hello, you're joining us for Wednesday's Look North. First tonight, we start with a heartfelt plea to the Look North audience. Could you be a potential kidney donor and save the life of a Wakefield teenager? 14-year-old Lucas Burroughs has end-stage kidney disease and has spent 10 hours a day connected to a dialysis machine. His only hope is a transplant, but his parents are not a match. Now they're hoping a stranger will come forward to give Lucas that ultimate gift. Nicola Reese reports. How's it looking all right? It's a daily routine that Lucas wishes would end. He's a prisoner in his own bedroom. It's keeping him alive, uh, but it's taking away every freedom he could have as a 14 year old. At home in Wakefield, he spends 10 hours a day connected to his dialysis machine. It means mum and dad have had to become nurses. This is basically the tubes that are keeping him alive. Instead of him obviously weighing or urinating, it, it does the same job. I'm always thirsty because I'm only allowed like 500 millilitres a day at the minute. That's usually how much I'd have with dinner time. Lucas has been seriously ill since December 2022. He has a condition called dense deposit disease. It's rare and aggressive and caused his kidneys to shut down. It's almost overnight. Um, you've got a healthy 12 year old boy at Christmas um, and he comes and says, Dad, my wee's a bit weird. And it's that moment of dread, it's that moment that we all fear in life when you look and you know instantly something's not right uh, and his wee was just blood. Try and get to 70. 80. So this is 80. Lucas needs a kidney transplant, but his parents can't give him one of theirs. Now they're desperately hoping that a living donor, someone they don't even know, will come forward to help. For some reason, I'd psych myself into the fact that I'm the mum and I would be the one donating. And um, I was convinced we'd share the same blood group. But obviously, we, we need help and that's, that's why we're appealing. Um, and I'd hope that if any of my friends were in the same situation or anyone we knew, that Dan and I would both get tested and we'd do the same thing for them. When I'm thirsty, it's really hard. Because all you can think about when you're thirsty is drinking. I wish I could go on the trampoline and play with my brother and, and just do the stuff I could do before and, like, go running and... The family are adapting to a new normal and Lucas is making the most of the things he can do. I've had to learn how to cook so I can actually eat the stuff I c that I'm allowed to eat. We're not naive enough to think there's a miracle cure at the minute, but this will just give him a normal, decent shot at a life. And that's all we can ask for as parents. There's a certain point where you just don't care anymore. You don't care about the risks and you just want to get it over with and have a transplant. That's good. It's all good. It's just we know statistically there's matches out there. Um, and if you've got O positive, O negative blood, you're in the running and the, the hospital will take care of the rest. And if you can come forward, that would be amazing. It would mean I've done my job as a dad. And you, you can't put it simpler than that. 
Gosh, Dan Burroughs ending that report there from Nicola Rees. In a moment, we will give you details of how you can get in touch if you think you could help Lucas. But first, let's meet Dr Sunil Dagger. He's a renal consultant at St James's Hospital here in Leeds and a scientific advisor at Kidney Research Yorkshire. Doctor, it is so heartbreaking to see the pain that Lucas and his family are going through. But there are 550 people waiting on the list currently for a donor. This is a really big ask, isn't it? Well, absolutely. Those figures are just from Yorkshire, but if you think across the country, they are even ten, ten times more. And it is absolutely, as Lucas described, it's the devastating effect of kidney disease on health and various aspects of life. It's, it's really heartbreaking, yeah. Why is a live donor best option? Well, for a number of reasons. Uh, the kidneys from living person last longer, so you get a kidney that can last 20, 25 years on average. That's a great start as compared to having from a waiting list, that could be about 10 to 12 years. But the most important thing is about the timing. If you've got somebody who comes forward to donate a kidney, that means some of the effect of dialysis can be avoided. They can live healthy life and they can live longer healthy lives. So that's, that's why it's really important to have living kidney donors. Well, we have been speaking to a live donor. Five years ago, James Collins from Selby gave his kidney to a patient. He was on the transplant list and he gave his kidney at the same time that his wife needed one. So it was a bit of a swap, if you like. He says he had absolutely no regrets. My day-to-day -day life hasn't changed. I still go to the gym. I'm still able to have a drink. I play with my kids. I go out and do everything that any other person would do. Um, but I see the positive impact in my wife in having a kidney it just, it's just phenomenal compared to, it's compared to the minimal impact that it's had on me. And I would do it again in a heartbeat. Uh, if I had more kidneys to give, anybody who needed one could have one. Talk us through the process if anyone wants to do what we've just heard. Well, absolutely. So anybody could be a kidney donor. The key thing really is, is the NHS would make sure that their health currently is good, but also the health after kidney donation is preserved. So what that means is they have to go through a very stringent process that involves a number of tests, I'm afraid, that could be over anywhere three to six months. But essentially, this is to safeguard um, their health uh, and now, but also for future. OK, well, Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. And we have got some details that will be coming up on our screen at the moment, if we can get to the right point on auto -cue. Um You can email... I'll tell you what, why don't you tell us? There it is, leadskidneyappeal at nhs.net. It's there on your screen right now. If you think that you could help Lucas, then please do get in touch with them. Doctor, thank you so much for your thank time. You. It's good to see you. Next tonight, the battle to save two West Yorkshire dementia care homes from closure has taken another twist today. Council-run Claremont House in Hetman Wyke and Castle Grange in Huddersfield were given a reprieve amid mass protests. Well, the plan was that long-term they would be transferred to private companies, but now that's happening far sooner than campaigners thought. Our political reporter, Gemma Dillon, joins us live now from outside the town hall in Huddersfield, where the future of the homes is currently being discussed. This has come a bit out of the blue, hasn't it, Gemma? It certainly has, Amy. Yes, a meeting of full council is taking place in the building behind me now. But around an hour ago, ahead of that building, just over 60 campaigners gathered outside for a variety of reasons. Some over the conflict in Gaza, others asking questions about the future of the leisure centre in Dewsbury and when that would be reopened. And as you say, more raising concerns about the future of Castle Grange and Clement House specialist dementia care homes. Um, now, I followed these campaigners over the last year as they fed, led a really emotional campaign to try and keep the care homes open. Um, the council wanted to close them as they faced some quite big financial problems. They won a reprieve earlier this year. The local authority said it would continue to run them, but only until an independent provider could be found. Now, last week, families were told officers at the authority wanted to enter deeper discussions with some of those providers. And they've told me the speed at which it's happened has blindsided them and they've still got some really big concerns. Oh, I've got huge concerns, basically that that could result in closure, so therefore I would be in exactly the same position as if 
advocate, please close the homes, but it would just be at the hands of a private provider, that the private provider would take over and not put in the investment that the home needs and therefore the staff would be um, unhappy or would not choose to stay, that the staff conditions and pay would be less and so therefore they would be forced to find alternative employment, that they would choose to change the usage of the home, so therefore keeping it in the care sector but not providing specialist dementia care. Now those campaigners, some of those families have gone into that council meeting tonight. They're in there now putting their questions and concerns direct to councillors, hoping to get some answers and some assurances over the future of those two homes. But Kirklees Council have told me that a decision was made for the council to continue to run the homes whilst exploring options for a transfer of ownership to independent care providers. They say an update on those talks will be presented to Cabinet to senior decision makers next month with a view to proceeding with further formal negotiations with interested providers. Now they also add that the Council's financial challenges are increasing and that they've been clear from the outset they want to consider options that will bring savings to the Council whilst causing minimal disruption for residents and their families. So I think, Amy, this has a while to run yet. Gemma, thank you. Let's take a look now at a senior West Yorkshire police officer who allegedly broke COVID rules to have sex with a junior officer and he's admitted gross misconduct. Chief Superintendent Daniel Greenwood, who was a district commander in Bradford and had been in charge of the force's COVID response, resigned yesterday ahead of today's misconduct hearing into his behaviour. Abigiola has been following the story. She joins us now. So what exactly has Chief Superintendent Daniel Greenwood accused of? Well, Daniel Greenwood was um, a chief superintendent. He was a senior police officer. He was a district commander for Bradford, so he was in charge of policing the city. And then he was accused of having an affair with a junior colleague. And today there was a misconduct hearing. Tell us more about that. Well, the hearing was told that Mr Greenwood, who was 37 and married at the time, had begun a relationship with a probationary officer who was in her 20s, who he'd met in 2020, and who he'd previously advised on how to get a job within the force. Now, the hearing heard that the couple had met um, during 2021. They'd had an account encounter in a flat when COVID restrictions were in place. Now, Mr Greenwood disputes the date of that encounter and his police federation representative said while it wasn't an absolute breach of the Covid rules, it was obviously against the spirit of them. The woman Mr Greenwood was involved with was also, it turned out, having a relationship with a man who was later convicted of drug offences. But he has admitted gross misconduct, hasn't he? Yes, he's accepted responsibility responsibility. He was deemed not fit to give evidence in person at the misconduct panel. Today they were told he's been uh, diagnosed with an alcohol addiction and PTSD and is under extreme emotional um, strain. But Mr Greenwood did resign yesterday before this hearing began and tomorrow the misconduct panel will decide whether he would have been sacked by West Yorkshire Police if he hadn't already resigned. Abby, thank you. Let's have a look now at some other stories coming into the newsroom. A West Yorkshire building firm has been fined after an 81-year-old York grandfather died when he fell through an unguarded hole um, in his own bathroom floor five years ago. Kenneth Armitage landed on the kitchen floor and was found dead the next day. Mr Armitage's bathroom was being converted into a wet room by Wakefield firm Cooper and Westgate. The company had been fined £150,000 after an investigation by the Health and Safety Executive. A keen North Yorkshire cyclist who walked his daughter down the aisle just weeks ago has died while cycling the length of the country for charity. Eric Oakley was halfway through his two-week challenge for Cancer Research UK when he collapsed near Settle. He was given CPR by a passerby and his wife, who had been in the support vehicle but could not be saved. Donations to his Just Giving page for Cancer Research have now surpassed £8,000. It's been such a, a whirlwind of emotions, to be honest, because 
uh, only got married sort of four weeks ago and my dad was there to be able to walk me down the aisle, which um, I'm so incredibly grateful and feel incredibly lucky that he was still with us when that happened. Um, because originally this challenge was potentially penciled in for June. The, uh, the plan is very much to finish what dad started, set off from where, where dad finished his ride. And we're so sorry for the loss to Eric's family. Oh, where are you? There you are. You're watching Wednesday's Look North, still to come on tonight's programme. The dying art of lifting gansies calls for more people to make their intricate fishermen's jumpers. Rugby League legend Rob Burrow's award-winning BBC podcast is back, featuring interviews he recorded just before his death in June. Rob Burrow's Seven Meets was a first-of-its-kind podcast. The first episode, Series 2, is now available on BBC Sounds, with the rest dropping on September the 26th to mark what would have been Rob's 42nd birthday. It features Kevin Sinfield, boxer Ricky Hatton and cricketer Stuart Board. Now, Opera North are used to raising a roof or two, but usually inside the theatre. However, today, as a real treat to shoppers at Leeds Trinity Centre, one of their singers performed a song from The Magic Flute, which opens at Leeds Grand next week. Tom Ingle was there too. Drop of She's got a talent your average busker strumming a guitar can only dream of. Even so, Opera North singer Anna Dennis had to work to keep hold of her audience, who were only really thinking about spending tenors, not listening to them. We're performing the magic flute at Opera North, and my role in the story is Queen of the Night. She's had her daughter abducted, and she's very, very angry about it. <laughs> And yet, not one of the shoppers at the Leeds Trinity Centre offered to come to her aid. Just as well it's only a story. It's a famous piece. It, it has this, this high note top super F, as it's called in it, and it kind of hops around up there. <laughs> and everybody knows that tune, I think, even if they're not sure where it comes from. It comes from Mozart's Magic Flute, which Opera and North are performing next week in Leeds. The company wants the joy of the art form to spread beyond the footlights. It's a very unusual thing, actually, for a uh, British city to have its own opera company. We have a full-time orchestra, a full-time chorus, and we want the people of Leeds to know about that and to feel that they are part of our community and that we are part of theirs. And how better to do that than to come out to a shopping centre and surprise them. It was so lovely to watch people enjoying it, have their cameras out and really feel that they were invested in what we were doing. It's got a nice dome up above. I guess we were sort of bouncing off that a bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'll come, I'll return late <laughs> at night to try it without a microphone and see, see whether I can shatter the, the glass and the ceiling. Having delivered a cracking aria in your area, Anna will be back on the boards proper next week. Spellbinding as it was, we understand the soprano has no plans for a full tour of shopping centres. Tom Ingle, BBC Look North, Leeds. It's a bit of a treat while you're on your lunch break, that, isn't it? Now, do you know what a Gamsey is? I didn't know a thing about it until today. So to landlubbers like me, it's a fisherman's jumper. And 100 years ago, every man in every Yorkshire village on the coast wore one of these. They're durable, they're warm, they're designed for all weathers. But now the old age craft of hand knitting them is dying out. Carla Fowler has been to meet a woman who's determined that that won't happen. Sharing the old ways to keep them alive. And then what we're going to do is we're going to concentrate on the, the pattern is in the... At a Gamsey knitting workshop in Filingthorpe, already accomplished knitters are learning some of the traditional patterns now, sadly seen less and less. Deb Gillanders is the champion of the humble fisherman's jumper. She teaches the techniques and the secret symbolism of local patterns. And this week, she's also put on a public display of Gamsey's. 
Robin Hood's Bay, all of these ones. Whitby, all of these ones. I'm just out of shot there of Norfolk. Stuff behind me from Flamborough, Filey. Ideally, they were knitted in five ply worsted wool. So it's never going to go pilled. It's tightly spun, tightly knit. This one that I'm wearing now and the one that I'm knitting now, I can get about 10 to the inch, which is ridiculous. This is the largest Gansey collection in the UK with a wide variety of patterns on display. Every village had its own. It was said a drowned man's home could be identified by his Gansey. Yorkshire ones feature diamonds representing fishing nets. Ladders mean rigging and cables for ropes. It's amazing that uh, someone can look at a Gansey and be able to tell who actually knitted it. The connections through the families and stuff like that. As I said, I feel a bit bad having not turned up with a Gansey on. Oh, I knitted one for my granddaughter so she could come from London and hold her head up in Whitby. I was on the lifeboat for 27 years and uh, they used to give you these power and life Ganses, but they were, they were, they're not a patch on these things. With only a handful of authentic Gansey makers left, more men are joining the fight to keep the tradition alive. Graham took two years to knit his first. Time and effort, yes. But you can do it in, just in the gaps in, in life, I think. You chill out when you're doing it, there's nothing else. You're thinking about the patterns and that's it. And, and, and designing it as well. And the, what the next challenge will be when you're starting at the bottom, the next bits, when you get to the arms, you're always thinking ahead. To get more people into this local craft, Deb introduced many at the Made in Whitby Festival this summer to knitting. Young and old, man and woman, even Krampus likes a Gansey. The team is now growing and they're picking up the threads of the Gansey story. Carla Fowler, BBC Look North, Filingthorpe. And that display is on until Sunday at Flying Thorpe Methodist Church. Oh, I'd love a Gansey. Would you? I like a knit. It was a big moon last night, wasn't it? Well, you must have had a good view going up the A64 to York. As it was going up, yeah. That's right. I mean, it was um, not necessarily a lot bigger, but wow, it was bright, mm. wasn't it? I think it's something like 30% brighter. Anyway, we've got more of your pictures after the weather. In the short term, how fantastic has the weather been again today? I mean, people sunbathing there at Museum Gardens in York, taking full advantage of the weather. And, uh, you know, it's been similar weather conditions right across uh, Yorkshire. That was... Uh, Malham. I mean, it's not often you see a sky as clear as that, but it's been a magnificent day across the Yorkshire Dales. Similar conditions here during tomorrow. So keep your pictures coming in. We do appreciate them on X, on Instagram and on the Weather Watcher website. So the headline tomorrow, well, there will be more cloud around, generally speaking, and it could be slower to clear. I think the best of the weather tomorrow will be across the Yorkshire Dales, Malham, Grassington. But high pressure is in charge. A bit more of an easterly. That's helping to feed more cloud in from the North Sea. Uh, but that cloud should break up. And it's a similar forecast for Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Cloudy starts and then that sun gets to work on the cloud. We should all see some sunshine during the afternoons. Now, there's a satellite picture. You might just be able to pick out cloud just around the coast of both Lincolnshire and Yorkshire and that is eventually going to head in from the North Sea. Another big moon to see this evening before it does eventually cloud over, that cloud filtering through southwest and later North Yorkshire with the exception there you can see of the Yorkshire Dales where temperatures will drift back to six or seven degrees. So tomorrow's high water times in Scarborough at 524, Bridlington at 543. So generally a lot of cloud at first with the exception of the Dales, who will have another glorious day. And you can see the sun breaks up the cloud from west to east. There might be a bit of cloud into the afternoon in coastal areas, but most parts of Yorkshire will become sunny and really quite warm for mid-September, 21 Celsius at 70 Fahrenheit. And then through the evening, further sunshine. That cloud moves back in Thursday night. It leaves Friday quite cloudy, actually. That cloud reluctant to clear in place. Variable cloud, some sunshine over the weekend. That's the forecast. Just wanted to hold on until I the know. weekend. Thank you, Paul. Well, were you dancing in the moonlight last night? For those of us with clear skies, the rare harvest moon, super moon and lunar eclipse all rose in, rolled into one and it was certainly glorious. Here are some of the pictures of you that you shared with us. It was indeed a marvellous night for moon dancing. <laughs>